everybody. Welcome to the Hidden Gems Podcast. This is a show where we like to look at streaming services and talk about some hidden gems on those streaming services beyond like the big name titles that they have. And it's a lot of fun. We pick a different service each week. And I'm film critic Rachel Wagner and Ryan is here. Uh, hey, Rachel. It's great to be back with you once again, as always. Uh, we're going to be diving into Amazon Prime this week. I, I think this is like the sixth episode we've done. And Every time I think, oh boy, this is probably going to be the one where I'm like scraping the bottom of the barrel and come up with like a handful of wood shavings. This time around, I was like, it, it was literally the theme of, surely I've recommended this before, right? And it turns out, <laughs> no, no, I haven't. And yeah. I'm like, surely I must have. And like, no, no, I haven't. Well, it's going on the list this time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's really a lot on Amazon Prime, and we never have a problem like coming up with our lists. And uh, yeah, this is our sixth episode for Amazon Prime. And so let us know if you're listening what you've been watching on Amazon Prime. They have a bunch of uh, series that, you know, that are highly praised, Mrs. Maisel and Invincible and other things like that. So let us know what you've been watching. And uh, yeah, we're going to dive in to, I think mostly, I think all of us just had uh, movie recommendations this week. All of mine are, yes. Yeah, I think so. So, all right. Well, very fun. And let's dive in. It, it's interesting. The first one that I'm going to talk about, it's listed on Amazon Prime as something different. It's called uh, the, uh, I lost it. Let me find it. Um, it's called The Dating Coach. And uh, it, it's it's actually on Hallmark Channel. It was released as How to Fall in Love, and so you can watch. But it's the same movie. So, <laughs> and it's weird because on Amazon Prime you can find How to Fall in Love on there, but you have to be subscribed to Hallmark Movies uh, now on Amazon Prime in order to watch it as How to Fall in Love. But you can watch it as The Dating Coach as part of your Amazon Prime. So it's pretty weird. <laughs> But this is one of my favorite Hallmark movies that they've ever released on Christmas. Uh, it's really charming. It's got Eric Mabius, who you might recognize from Ugly Betty or some other shows that he's done. And he plays this nerd who can't get the courage to uh, ask girls out and he's just really struggling. And uh, there's this girl that he knew from high school who he basically hires to be his dating coach as the alternate title uh, found. And he's played by Rick Diorce, who is just really lovely and funny and uh, they have great chemistry together. It's very charming. Uh, and of course, you know, as, as, she, as she's training him to be, on dating they get closer and closer and you fill in the blanks but it's it's a really fun ride and Kathy and Jimmy is in it and she's fun it's like her sassy co-worker uh it's just a delight <laughs> I uh I do enjoy me some Kathy and Jimmy I always love her in Sister Act as uh, Sister mm, Mary Patrick yeah. I love yeah. how <clears throat> I love how uh, how bubbly she is in that whole movie she, yeah. There's a there's a great line in there where she, where she says, "My mom said I was either going to be a nun or a stewardess." Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you like that energy, then I think you'd really like Brooke Jorce, and I think you'd like this movie. It's a really cute rom com. Well, not to tip my hand too early, but let's say around Christmas, I'm planning to watch a lot of Hallmark movies for the channel. Keep a little bit of suspense, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> great. That's good to hear. Good to hear. And by Christmas, you mean October, if you're talking Hallmark movies. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm, I'm still a novice, so you give me the, <laughs> the beginner's curve, I, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That'll be fun. Uh, so yeah, people should check this one out. I, it's, I, it's pretty universally lauded as one of the better non-Christmas Hallmark movies. I, I, it's, so it's very well done. So what do you have as your first? So my first choice, the trademark hard left coming at it again, talking about falling in love to two guys going after a train. It's from 2010 and it was called Unstoppable. Uh, this was directed by Tony Scott, who most of you probably know directed Top Gun and Days of Thunder. Also directed a bunch of other movies like American Gangster, starring Denzel Washington. 
But this was my, <clears throat> excuse me, this was my first introduction to Tony Scott as a director. And this is based on a true story. It tells a story of this train in, in rural Pennsylvania that gets, that basically the conductor loses control of it. And this is not just your standard, like, you know, like kind of a choo-choo train. Like, no, this is, this is a serious problem because this train has about seven or eight cars worth of this substance called molten phenol. It's basically TNT on a train and it's going 70 miles an hour. And for trains, that's like less like us going in a car at 150 miles an hour. And they're about to hit a lot of densely populated Pennsylvania towns. Not a good day at the office. Enter our two main characters played by Denzel Washington and Chris Pine. Pine plays kind of the rookie on the job, and Denzel Washington is about 90 days or so away from retirement. Spoiler alert, he doesn't die, because the, 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 uh, the old cliche is the person who has two weeks left to retire has, ends up dying, but Denzel doesn't die in the movie. Spoiler alert. That's good. That's good. <clears throat> That's a relief. And I've always really liked this movie. I think maybe I was just an impressionable youth when I saw this in 2010, but I thought this movie was just like pins and needles level tension because the movie is pretty much all action minus about 15 minutes of setup to get to know that Chris Pine is going through a bit of marriage problems. Denzel Washington's character is, uh, is about to retire though that retirement may not be as rosy as it sounds. There's a bit of tension because Pine is the rookie and, and Washington's the veteran and all that. And then it all changes once the train goes completely haywire. And, and literally, they're not even supposed to go after this thing. They're supposed to get out of the way and, and wait for this derailer to come around, which Denzel has been around long enough to know that's not going to work. So they go after a radical strategy where they go up from behind and try and clip it from behind and slow it down with their train. It, it sounds crazy enough to just work. And like I said, this is definitely all action and there's definitely, there's definitely a lot of ouch worthy moments. There's this one moment where Chris Pine gets his hand stuck in between a train and like a piece of metal or no way, not his hand, his foot. And it's about as painful as you might imagine. <laughs> as you might imagine. And so that's just, that's just like, that's just like one scene. This movie is just breakneck from like a certain point onward. You have Rosario Dawson in here. Uh, I believe his name is Kevin, ne not Kevin Nealon, but he was Sam's dad in the Transformers movies. He's in there as the, uh, as the, as the head of this train company who couldn't care less and is quite frankly, not very good at his job. It's kind of a throwback to like some of the late 90s action movies, but that's kind of what makes it fun. I highly recommend this. Yeah, I've never seen this one. Uh, so that sounds interesting. It sounds fun. For some reason, I was thinking, isn't one of the Liam Neeson movies named Unstoppable? No, that's Nonstop. That was directed oh, by Wami Colette Sarah. Or no, wait. Nonstop was the plane movie. Uh, the Commuter was the train movie. Mm, okay. He's made so many movies with Wami Colette Sarah that they kind of blend together at a certain yeah. point. I know. <laughs> yeah, Liam Neeson on a plane, Liam Neeson on the train. Next thing, next thing you know, it's going to be Liam Neeson on a boat. Liam Neeson going after right. his daughter. <laughs> Liam Neeson is a lion, though he's awesome in the Narnia movies. But anyway. <laughs> well, most of my recommendations this episode are uh, romantic comedy-ish I guess but I had one exception um, it is a documentary it's called Enron the smartest guys in the room and I think they should make anybody who is going to get a business degree it should be like forced to watch this documentary because what I think is so interesting is it not only tells the story of the Enron um, collapse the rise and collapse and uh, scandal uh, and the whistleblowers uh, stories, uh, but it also just, it, it's so interesting to see how they justified what they did to people and what uh, they, uh, the practices that they held because they, they were able to talk themselves into it being innovative. We're not doing anything wrong. We're doing something new. <laughs> and the more they talked about it, the more I think they actually believed it. 
and and then you you make kind of one you lose your integrity once and then it's easier to do it again the second time and the third time and the fourth time and until you have this this you know, disaster uh, and you convinced yourself that you haven't done anything wrong and that everybody else just needs to see it the way that you see it even though all that you've left this path of destruction in your in your past it's very interesting and very well done and uh i think uh it's it's sobering and you you definitely think like what would you do if you were asked would you be the whistleblower would you or would you go along i think it's easy to think that we would do the right thing but when you're tempted by peer pressure the money the other things and it's amazing like how uh how deep everything got they took down a i forget i think it was arthur anderson i believe is the name or something like that the there's an accounting company that had been around since the since the like 1800s and was taken down by the enron thing there was uh there was the whole state of california which lost power uh and uh the governor of uh california basically ended up getting recalled because of that whole mess and so then Arnold Schwarzenegger ended up becoming governor. So it had like these huge ripple effects uh, beyond just, you know, greedy people. Uh, and uh, it was very interesting. It's very well done, uh, very entertaining um, as far as, you know, like it, the pacing and everything like that is very uh, well done. Um, it's technically rated R, but it's only maybe for a little language and some, uh, like they they have some, scenes where the care where the people were in like strip clubs and stuff so they have some suggestive scenes in those in those uh some photos and things like that but i i think it's it's fine and uh in that regard but it's just very interesting and i think uh that if you you are you're, you know running a business or uh you know thinking if it, it thinking about things like this then it, it'd be very uh very worthwhile to watch why am I not surprised that people like this would end up in a strip club? <laughs> right. <laughs> Seems very on brand for them, including yes. like golf, yachts, and strip clubs. Not, no offense to golf. I'm, I love playing golf, but still, yeah. it just kind of fits their image. But as but, far as, yeah. as far as this goes, I have heard a ton about this, this particular documentary. The only thing the only real thing that I know about Enron is that Robin Williams made a joke about it in one of his stand-up specials and how there was this news story in like 02 when when this large company bought up a large place in Texas and and he was like he's like well we could call a fifth amendment failed <laughs> or something like that oh and, yeah and then the punchline is like Arthur Anderson put in the chairs so of course they're not going to work <laughs> and Robin right, could do it Robin could do it a ton better than I could, but Stadium. I'm sure you've done my work. <laughs> but there's there's actually an interesting documentary that I watched in college. I had to watch it for my international relations minor, and it was about the financial crisis. I know Enron is here, and the 0708 mm -hmm. stuff is over here, but it's called Inside Job. It was narrated yeah. by Matt Damon. Sounds really good too. Scary stuff, but it's a well put together documentary, and. The funny thing is that I remember like seeing like those commercials for like you and us, UBS, and like and like all of these companies that no longer exist anymore because they built it up on smoke and mirrors and it just it was all sound and fury that signified nothing and millions lost pretty much everything and it still has a ripple effect today, which is sad, but here we are. Yeah, that inside job is excellent as well. Uh, that is done, I think, by uh, let me check. It was by I think it was by HBO, if my memory serves me right. Oh no, wait, it mm. was Sony Pictures Classic. Um, yeah, the let me check one thing. Sorry, Got this all out. Um, yeah, so yeah, the inside job that was very good as well. And I highly, I definitely recommend that uh, documentary. Uh, this one is was direct, is directed by Alex Gibney, and he did a movie last year called Totally Under Control, which was all about basically about Trump and the um and the COVID crisis. 
And so that was, you know, got a lot of big, uh, big attention, but, uh, but I don't know this, I just think that it's so easy to look at something like what happened with Enron and be like, Oh, just the greedy guys. I would never do that. Mm-hmm. Would you, are you sure? Watch this. And then, I mean, I hope I wouldn't, but <laughs> it's not like, it's not like you go down that road one, one scoop at a, you know, you do it little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit until, uh, you know, you, it, it's like, uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's not something that you just decide overnight that I'm going to defraud people. Uh, you let your integrity down and then, and then you go, can go down that, that road. Uh, and so I don't know. I think it's a very cautionary tale, I guess I would say. You know, the old saying go, <coughs> excuse me. You know, the old saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So I highly recommend it. I think it's a very good documentary. What do you have next? So my next choice is a movie from 2010, or sorry, 2009, sorry, from 2009, and it is called Leatherheads. Uh, This was actually directed by George Clooney, and it stars him as Dodge Connolly, a player in like the super early, early days of what we call the NFL. Now, back in like the early 1920s, pro football was nothing like it is today. Today, It's like multi-million dollar contracts. It's like $10 million to get commercial space in the Super Bowl for like five second ad or 10 second ad. But back in the early 20s, pro football was a joke. Now, college football was like the premier, but pro football was like an outlaw mud show, both figuratively and sometimes quite literally. But Dodge Connolly believes in it so much that he poaches the biggest college football star in the form of Carter Rutherford played by John Krasinski, onto, um, onto his team, the Duluth Bulldogs. And this is basically a kind of a historical fiction take on how what we know as the NFL basically came into be and how it was the dying of the Outlaw Mud Show stuff and the beginning of what we know today. This is not a true story. Let me just get that out of the way. But it it's, it's definitely feels like it could be true it, it feels like a legend like like mm. like legends have let every legend has about a kernel of truth in there so i would imagine that there was a dodge connelly s figure like here somewhere and this is just a really fun movie it's very interesting george clooney i think it's only directed like a handful of movies and i think minus suburbicon which i flat out did not like i think that he can be very good behind the camera and that goes double for here I love his performance here. John Krasinski is in here. This was in the middle of his big run in The Office. This was like just about as The Office was about to hit its peak, like 09, 010, just about there. And so, and this was before Krasinski would do Quiet Place and just completely crush it there. And it and it shows that he has a lot of potential. Uh, Renee Zellweger is in here. Jonathan Price is in here as a, uh, as Carter Rutherford's a sleazy manager. And this is very much a period piece and, 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 and there's like 1920s dripping all over this from like the old timey ads to the cars to, to even the radio ads where it's like, it, like this program is sponsored by Coca-Cola, delicious and refreshing. Also suitable gasoline. I mean, it's Coca-Cola, so maybe, but anyway. It all culminates in a big game. This is very much a sports movie. It's not rewriting the the handbook, if you will, but I think it's a lot of fun. And there's a particularly funny fight near about three quarters of the way. So definitely look out for that. If you haven't checked it out, I do recommend. Yeah, I actually haven't seen this one, but I remember you recommended it for best and worst to George Clooney. Oh, that's right. I was, yeah. I was thinking to myself, have I recommended this before? But then I was like, and it was like, maybe I should leave it off. But then it was like, and then you just reminded me it was best and worst. So it, it's yeah. still in the, it's still in the playing field. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, that's, that sounds, sounds good. Isn't Renee Zellweger, she's in that, right? Yeah. As this, uh, as a, as a reporter and, uh, and she's not like, she's not like a damsel in distress. She's not like, she's not like overbearing, but she's not like completely helpless. She's in the middle somewhere. And that's, 
that's very nice. She can, she mm -hmm. can more than hold her own as the as this journalist. She talks smack to her boss at the paper, and she does not she does not enjoy Dodge's um, romantic advances at first. But you'll just have to see it in order to understand. Like that's I said, good. this is this is definitely underrated and definitely a primer for what we would see with John Krasinski in the in the next decade with A Quiet Place and Jack Ryan and just everything that he's doing right now. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. Well, my next choice is maybe a little bit borderline hidden gem, uh, but I don't think it gets the love that it deserves. A lot of people do love it, but I'm talking about Return to Me. And this is one of my favorite rom-coms. I absolutely love it. Uh, Mini Driver uh, plays a woman who is getting a heart transplant or needs a heart transplant. David Duchovny uh, plays a architect who is, at the beginning of the film, is married to a zoologist. And uh, they are uh, you know, very much in love and everything. And then tragedy strikes and uh, I don't think this is too much of a spoiler. It's inherent to the plot. Uh, basically, his wife passes away in an accident and Minnie Driver ends up getting the heart of his wife. And then years later, they end up meeting and uh, so they don't know that they have this connection. Uh, and David Allen Greer's in it. He's really funny. Uh, they, it has um, Bonnie Hunt, uh, who is really funny with Jim Belushi as <laughs> her sister, who has like tons of kids and is always swearing <laughs> around the kids <laughs> and forgetting because he's stressed out. And she's very, very funny, I think, in it. And then you also have this whole troop of, of older, uh, older people who are work in the restaurant that they they have a, a italian irish restaurant which i've always wanted ever since seeing this movie <laughs> and, and they constantly debate about what is better uh, irish things or italian things so they're like um and they're just so funny and so charming and i love them and uh it's really good it's emotional it's funny and they have great chemistry between david Duchovny and mini driver and uh, yeah it's got a great supporting cast it's just so good i love it you know i've always wanted to try corned beef lasagna yes <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that and they have like that. sauerkraut and fettuccine. It's like the greatest. Thing. Wow, <laughs> it's like yeah. it's like spaghetti a la Guinness or something. Yeah. <laughs> and have you seen this? No, I, but uh, but just the prospect of an Italian Irish restaurant. It's like I'm I go, know. I'm, <laughs> I've I've been to Ireland before, and if anyone thinks I'm stereotyping, literally <laughs> everywhere someone had like a Guinness in their hand. It's like they drink that more than water over there. Yeah, and, and sh she's an artist, and uh, so she's uh, there's she was dreamed of going to Rome to paint, um, and so there's that kind of works into the plot as well, and and uh, yeah, they. Um, uh, I forget. Uh, it's the guy from All in the Family. Carol O'Connor. Yeah. One of, one of my all time favorites. I love yeah. All in the Family. I mean, he plays talk, her grandpa. Talk, talk about a show that could never get greenlit today because, because, because Archie Bunker would just be canceled left, right, and center. And I just, that's kind mm -hmm. of his charm because he, he calls Rob Reiner a meathead. And it just, whatever. I know Rob Reiner is like super talented and like has written many great movies, but whenever I see him in like an interview, I'm like, Meathead. Meathead. <laughs> I can't help myself. Well, he is really funny in this. And like I said, there's this whole group of, there's like five or six of them that are always debating about Irish versus uh, Italian stuff. And what's better, Dean Martin versus uh, Bing Crosby or... I don't know, <laughs> but it's really fun. Uh, I yeah, highly and, recommend this one. And let's not get it twisted. Carol O'Connor is one of the best TV actors ever. Even after All in the Family, he would go on to be in the In the Heat of the Night TV show as uh, Will as Will Steiger's role in uh, as Bill Gillespie. 
So, uh, so he had a long and long career making mm-hmm. small appearances in these bigger movies and just, I could talk about Carol O'Connor for days, but we, but mm-hmm. that'll be for another time. Yeah, and like so, David Alan Greer plays David Cubney's for uh, his best friend, and they're really fun together. It's just, it's just a very good movie. I highly recommend it. One of my favorite movies. So I don't say that lightly. <laughs> yeah, that's it's, that carries a lot of weight. Yeah, and it's also nice, like in this day and age, that she has this big scar on her chest from her surgery. And they have this whole relationship and manage to have chemistry uh, without him realizing that she has this. So obviously, like, they don't, they keep the in- intimacy at bay. And the fact that they're able to do that and still have things be very, very uh, hot between them, very great chemistry, uh, I think says something that we don't necessarily need to, uh, you know, need to be you know r-rated content in order to get that kind of chemistry right yeah so what is your next pick so my next (coughs) excuse me again so my next choice and this is kind of walking the tightrope of the hidden gem but i decided to include it because i think this director m night Shyamalan, gets a bad rap some for some very for for some very good reasons however when he does make a good movie, I want to celebrate it. And I really enjoy Unbreakable. I think this is like, like the Sixth Sense is number one, and this is like a very close second. Uh, it tells the story of a man named David Dunn, played by Bruce Willis, who is the lone survivor of a really, really bad train accident. And it's not like an, oh, he got a lot of injuries, but survived by the skin of his teeth. He literally survived without a scratch on him. This isn't like stubbing your toe on the bed, on like the bedpost. This was a train wreck and he walked away from it. And he is approached by a crippled man named Elijah Price, played by Samuel L. Jackson, who believes that, that David Dunn is a superhero. And of course, he thinks that this guy is just a complete kook and goes away from him. But the more he thinks about it, the more he's like, He's never been sick. He's never truly been hurt. He's super strong for some reason. And he just begins to put two and two together in his head of maybe he is a bit of a hero. And it just goes on from there. I think because of Glass, people just kind of discount this movie. But if you have not seen it, I do, like I said, I do highly recommend it. It's, it's got a great score from James Newton Howard. It's beautiful cinematography. M. Night Shyamalan's dialogue gets roasted a lot, but there's a lot of great lines here. Again, he's written a lot of bad lines, but when he writes a good line, I think it should be celebrated, and that goes double here. Uh, I dare not ruin the twist because this is a Shyamalan movie, and, well, there is a big reveal, and I will not reveal it if you have not seen it. But let's just say it's it's honestly really, really good, and you really do not see it coming. But then the more you think about it, the more you're like, oh, oh, this all makes sense. And of course, this would end up spawning an uh, inadvertent trilogy with Split in 2017, which provided my impetus to watch this movie for the first time, and Glass, which everybody seems to hate but me for some reason. But with Old coming out and, and, and M. Night Shyamalan still continuing to make stuff there's a part of me that is like he made one of my worst my one of my least favorite movies of all time the last airbender which almost killed my childhood memories of that show but at the same time he also made six Sense, unbreakable signs split i mean it it just and he is capable of doing good you just got to take the good with the bad he's very hit and miss so i'm a fan but i'm not a blind fan Watch him in like an interview and like he is just the most passionate dude about filmmaking that you would ever hope to see. Like half of his Twitter account is just like, just wrote 20 pages today. I'm so pumped for you all to see what I have next. You're just like, I can't wait. And it may turn out to be garbage, but it may turn out to be great. I'm surprisingly looking forward to his next movie, Old. It looks very intriguing. And again, I'm not a blind fan. Old could turn out to be a complete dud, but hey, I respect Shyamalan because he creates his original stuff 
And the only adaptation he did do, which was not very good, it was horrible. But as far as Unbreakable goes, it's severely underrated and it's definitely a number two for me in like my ranking of Shyamala. It's Sixth Sense, then Unbreakable at like a close second. It's interesting because I would not describe this movie as underrated. I think that is it is. I know so many people that say that it's like a masterpiece and it's the greatest and one of the best comic book movies ever made. And I'm not on that front with this movie. I I think it's good. I gave it like a B. I enjoyed it, uh, but I definitely am not on the masterpiece camp. There's a couple things that don't really make sense to me. Well, I don't know how spoilery this is, but like the fact that he can hear when people have, what crimes people have committed. Well, first of all, that would be exhausting in the, like in the train station, everybody that speed it, you could hear like everybody's committed crimes. Um, but then also you have this guy who literally leaves these two girls <laughs> chained up in this bathroom and then he goes to work. I'm mean, like, nobody would do that. Like you would, like that makes no sense. And so then he can sense the, the crime. The only reason they do that is because obviously they have to do that in order for him to see it, in order for him to know that he's the criminal and then go help the girls. But it doesn't make any sense. No criminal would be like, okay, well, I'm halfway through this crime. I'm gonna go to work now. Um, so there are things about this movie that don't make sense to me, but overall, it's 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 good. I like it. I like Samuel Jackson and I like Bruce Willis, and it definitely I agree with you on the music and the atmosphere, and it's definitely one of his better films. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually gave Fresh to Glass. <laughs> I'm not the only. Okay. I'm not the only one. But I a bunch of that out if you think it's too spoilery. That's fine. Um, no, that's, but, that's, um, that's fine, and I. I think um, I think calling this a comic book movie <laughs> is a bit of a stretch because it's not really based on anything. Like Iron Man is a comic book movie based because it's based on a comic book. Unbreakable yeah. was an original idea from Shyamalan's own head. Well, that's the same argument used against in The Incredibles, but I, I mean, they're both superhero movies then, if not comic book movies. There you go. That but, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, but I don't know. I just feel people. I, I, I think people actually talk this movie up too too much. Like, I think it's good. I don't think it's like, I, I feel like people treat it like a masterpiece. It's not on that level for me. Uh, I tend to not be a big fan of Shyamalan. I'm just not a big twist person. Uh, I find that, uh, you know, a lot of his movies make me groan. Things like The Village or Lady in the Water made me want to die. I hate that movie. Um, uh <laughs> And I just felt like he, I mean, especially him adding himself into all these movies is just so cringeworthy. And especially in Lady in the Water when he's like this great writer who's going to save everybody. And you're just like, oh my gosh. And he's so, uh, he was so annoyed that people didn't like The Village that of course in his next movie, he has the critic get, sh get killed by the thing, you know, like, oh, <laughs> really was ridiculous i'm not a big actually a big fan of split i didn't love it um i think james mcavoy is great in that role um but i just did not like the whole being abused makes you special and that, that was very weird to me i wasn't a fan of that um but uh but yeah i don't know and yeah i agree with you on last airbender that one is atrocious unwatchable um I definitely had signs way too hyped for me. I, I, it came out when I was on my mission and people were like, this is the best movie ever. And then I watched it and I didn't think it was that great. Um, so I'm very, very hit and miss when it comes to Shyamalan. See, <laughs> I, had, had, uh, I had no idea what, <coughs> excuse me again. I had no idea what to expect when it came to signs. I watched it in my high school film class and, uh, my, and my teacher was like, all right, we're going to be studying signs. I'm not saying a word, just enjoy. And so, and so for the next few days, I was like, what is this all about? And then it, everything kind of falls into place. And I know people have a lot of issues with the movie and I understand to a certain extent, but 
I just really love Joaquin and Mel Gibson's performances here. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's, I think it's a beautiful movie and I, I, I actually want to review it someday. So I'll just make myself a mental note, but yeah. I, I didn't know I was stumbling upon to some hidden feelings on you, Rachel. I mean, so passionate about like uh, Shyamalan and his movies. We should yeah. review, we should review old together when it comes out. Yeah, that'd be fun. I'm up for it. I'm up for it. Uh, the the visit I thought was pretty fun. It was the visit. Stupid, the fun. visit was good. I saw that as his comeback because yeah. after after Earth, which was a Will Smith oh and Jaden Smith puff piece, uh, the visit <laughs> was just what the doctor ordered: low budget, found footage, M Night Shyamalan doing his own thing. The ending is wacky. It is just wacky as all get out, but. The rest of the movie is surprisingly really tension filled, and I I do recommend that one as well. If it yeah. does come up on a streaming service, I'll be recommending that. There we go. All right. Well, very good. Well, my next choice is a another I guess romantic dramedy more not than comedy. It's called the Jane Austen Book Club, and this is based on a book uh, that I enjoyed. And it's about six women who all join a book club. Well, uh, it's about uh, six, five, five women and one man who join a book club where they're going to read all of the Jane Austen novels. And this has an incredible cast. You have Maria Bello, Emily Blunt, Kathy Baker, Maggie Grace, Jimmy Smits. Uh, it has a Hugh Dancy in it. Uh, it's got a great cast, and so you get to see sort of each of these women and how their storylines are impacted kind of in mirror the, the Jane Austen novels and uh, what happens in their lives. I think it's well acted, and I think that uh, they all have chemistry. You believe them as friends, and I love Jane Austen, and so this was just a really fun uh idea i think and it made me want to join a jane austen book club <laughs> and i think hugh dancy is super super charming in it he's great who knew senator and, Manel organa liked the writings of jane austen what's that who knew the uh who knew senator bail organa like jane austen the more you yeah. know <laughs> so everybody should i don't know watch this it's pretty simple uh, and it is it is like a little bit soapy it's a little hallmarky although it has some some mature content like emily blunt uh she plays a teacher who's just kind of disillusioned from her marriage and she starts to get kind of tempted by a student that is uh, attracted to her and is she gonna is she gonna blur those lines and uh, so there's some deeper themes that that, are, that go on and what are they going to do. Uh, also, uh, Amy Brenneman and Jimmy Smits are having marital problems uh, that, that, you know, apart. Maggie Grace is a, uh, a lesbian and that is having a hard time with uh, keeping a relationship going. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's it's a it's just a good a good movie uh, with really good acting, some good writing, and uh, you know Jane Austen, the best. <laughs> so that's all I have to say about that one. But I think it's definitely worth checking out. Have you ever heard of this? Uh, no, no, actually, is this Hallmark? It sounds like no, it's not Hallmark. I'm just saying that it's a little soapy, kind of like the oh. in the romance and everything like that kind of like a homework kind of, movie but it definitely has deeper themes darker themes than a homework movie would have oh my that makes yeah. sense yeah pg-13 yeah so what's your next pick so my next pick is well um going from things about Jane Austen to a really, really depressing documentary, but also a weirdly uplifting one all at once. It's called The Resurrection of Jake the Snake. Uh, this is a documentary about former pro wrestler Jake the Snake Roberts. And in the 1980s, he was one of the biggest wrestling stars up there with like Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage and all of that. Uh, he grew up in the wrestling business with his father, Grizzly Smith, 
and I don't know how like this is going to work on the YouTube side of things, but let's just say his father was a, um, was a pedo. He was not a good person. And Jake the Snake, as a kid, was, um, was mentally and physically abused. I will go no further. But, as, but when he became a wrestler, it just, uh, he began a sustained downward spiral into drugs and alcohol and just very dark times that lasted far too long with, with, with like so, sober periods and then relapses and more sobriety and even worse relapses where the documentary begins is like the bedrock beneath rock bottom. Like by this point, he should have been a statistic. It's like, 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 like the Grim Reaper should have taken him, but he must have just forgotten him for some reason. Enter Diamond Dallas Page, another wrestler who has since, who by this time has created a, um, created a yoga program called DDP Yoga. Yes, it is a real thing. And as, and when they were both wrestlers, DDP took a lot of advice from Jake the Snake on wrestling, not on the drugs part, but, um, but in terms of ring psychology and just how to portray your character and all that. And so as a thank you for that, he, he vouches to take Jake in to, and to get him sober for good. This is not a fun watch. I'm just going to be straight up and honest with you. It, it has a lot of very complicated things about it. Uh, it goes into an in-depth history on Jake the Snake's history with drugs how his relationship with his family seemed ir irreparably broken. It just, it just doesn't look good. But, but by the end, the, this, this does have a happy ending. It, as, as, of, as of today, Jake the Snake Roberts just celebrated his 63rd or 4th birthday, and he's healthier now than he ever was 10 years ago. He is completely sober. Uh, he's actually working for All Elite Wrestling, which is the number two wrestling company in the world in the world right now. So, so this story does have a happy ending. But if you do watch this, and I do highly recommend that you do, it's a crier. Let me just let me just say that it will. And, and let me just say, you do not have to be a wrestling fan in order to appreciate it. It's it's about a man struggling with his demons, and I think that's something we all can sympathize with. Hopefully, at least. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. I was wish I could remember the name of the uh, uh, name of the wrestler. I was actually watching a documentary on, on a wrestler when I was on my last vacation uh, because it was just something that was on and it was very interesting. Uh, of course, I can't remember his name, uh, but um, uh, but yeah, those those kinds of bio docs can be really interesting. What was what was it called? Do you remember? Oh my gosh, he was. They even made like a whole like the WWE made a whole documentary about him because. Um, trying to because what was he, this? He had, was... he'd become kind of into talk radio and become kind of a Republican, so they put out this documentary. This was um. Ultimate Warrior. Yes. Yeah. You were Watch watching that. You were watching Dark Side of the Ring then. <laughs> On Annie. It, it yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, no. That was a biography. Uh, Dark Side of the Ring is oh, on okay, Vice. Yeah. Is on Vice, and when we get to a Hulu episode later on, I will be recommending that show. But yeah, those A and E biographies, minus the Randy Savage one, which made up a bunch of bull crap about his personal life, which I just did not agree with and was not true in the slightest. But mm -hmm. the Ultimate Warrior one is actually pretty spot on. So they're a little hit and miss, but I'm burdened with knowledge, unfortunately. So I, so throughout some of them, I was like, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's not even close to the truth. But yeah, then there are others, who, but then there are others that are like, oh, wow, that's actually quite spot on. And I actually didn't know that. So I, I take some of those docs with a grain of salt because I I am burdened with too much knowledge. So there's a part of me that's like, that's like, did you even try? Like, come on. <laughs> did you ever see the David Arquette doc? You cannot kill David Arquette. Yes. Yeah, from that, last year. Talk think? about because you most of you all probably are not wrestling fans, 
when David Arquette won the WCW title, that was like that was like a stain that we could not get rid of. And, yeah. and that wasn't Arquette's fault, to be quite honest. He was actually the big hero in all that. He donated all of his pay from that to the families of Owen Hart, who was a wrestler who died in 1999 after a stunt gone wrong, Brian Pillman, who died of a drug overdose, and Darren Drozdov, who was a wrestler who was paralyzed in the ring. He's still alive, but he he's a quadriplegic. He's confined to a wheelchair. He was paid like in the low six figures, and he donated his entire sum to those families. So good on him for that. But yeah, that documentary really showed that he he was really trying to make up for it, and I and I think he did. Yeah, it was a good documentary, I thought. Uh, all right. Well, my last recommendation is a movie that's very difficult to describe. <laughs> it's called The Dressmaker. <sighs> And this movie is about a woman played by Kate Winslet that has been away from her hometown for a long time because of an incident where she was kind of harassed out of town, I guess you'd say. So she comes back and she, uh, she starts designing dresses for all of the women in the town, um, but she also is slowly of trying to work in her revenge to all these women for what they did to her and then also it has liam hemsworth in it as her kind of clunky love interest and the first reason to watch this movie is the absolutely amazing clothes the the fact that this didn't get nominated for best costume is absolutely ridiculous they literally in australia they have a traveling exhibit, or they did, I don't know if they still do, but they had a traveling exhibit that went from town to town just on the clothes. <laughs> They're so beautiful. Uh, they have like a museum exhibit on the clothes from the dressmaker. They're so gorgeous. And uh, so there's that reason alone, but also it's just weird and different. And, uh, and Kate Winslet is great as usual. And uh, I I just liked it. It was something fresh and different and it has Hugo Weaving in it and Judy Davis and uh, and she look Kate Winslet looks gorgeous in the film. Uh, so I think people should check it out. It's a very odd, very quirky movie. I mean, Kate Winslet looks just beautiful in general, but I yeah. imagine it's like over 9,000 here. Yeah, yeah. She looks so pretty. And uh, so, I don't know, I just think it's worth uh, worth checking out. If you just feel like, I want to watch something different uh, that takes narrative chances and I don't know, then you should, then this is a good one to do. It's very difficult to describe, so I don't think I'm doing a very good job of it. <laughs> it's one of just those, watch it. <laughs> one of those where you need to see it to properly experience it. Right. And I, I it's one that is so different, could I, so I can understand some people not caring for it because it's weird, but I liked it. So, so what is your last pick? So my last pick is from 2010 again, and this is a remake, and I'm, I'm not like staunchly anti-remake I'm of the belief is like if they bring something new to the table I'll give it a chance it's that's not the case most times however this movie is the exception to the rule it is True Grit from 2010 this is the remake of the classic western starring John Wayne it netted John Wayne's only Oscar he should have gotten more but the Oscars were like he's a right winger no we're not doing that and he's just petty BS, but that's another story for another time. He should have won for the searchers, that's all I will say. But in the remake of True Grit, well, it's pretty much the same story as the original. A young girl named Maddie Ross, this time played by Haley Steinfeld, has her father, uh, her father is killed in the middle of the night. And so she tracks down not exactly the friendliest U.S. Marshal in the world named Rooster Cogburn, this time played by Jeff Bridges. And she's like, you will take me to find this, this, coward, this coward and you will shoot him. And Bruce was like, uh, and you are married to who? But she, but she eventually pays him and is like, okay, let's do this. And this is essentially an odyssey of, of these two. And 
a Texas Ranger named Labeef, played by Matt Damon, to eventually find this find this perpetrator, who's actually played by Josh Brolin really well, by the way. And this is actually my first exposure to Brolin. And of course, he would be Thanos and a bunch of other things. And he's been in a lot of movies and really good at them. Like I said, this is a remake. And like I said, I'm not, I'm like completely not anti-remake because I, all I want is for them to do just something different. And while True Grit is more of an adventure, the 2010 True Grit feels more like an intense hunt. It shows the perspective between, but uh, actually, let me scratch that. It shows just the perspective of just the main three, Labeef, Cogburn, and Matty Ross. We do not see Josh Brolin until like the last act of the movie. That is a risk, but I think the movie does a great job with it. This was written and directed by the Coen brothers, and we all know who they are. Jeff Bridges has done awesome work with them, with The Big Lebowski and a bunch of others. And so this is definitely not one of their comedies. This is definitely one of their darker movies, but I do appreciate that they took this story in a much different direction. As someone who grew up watching John Wayne movies and seeing that you know, the old adage of John Wayne rides off into the sunset, meaning the good guys get to win. The good guys get to win in this movie. However, it's a very twisted win. I won't spoil it if you haven't seen it. But in the end, this is one of the better remakes that I've ever seen. There was genuine effort put forth, beautiful cinematography, amazing acting. I believe Haley Steinfeld got nominated for this and should have won. But just on the whole, this is a great movie. It really is. Yeah, I actually haven't seen this one, believe it or not, uh, because it was before I started really reviewing films, and I, I, uh, I you know, just didn't watch a whole lot of westerns, so I have not caught up to it. But I've heard nothing but good things, and the Coen Brothers are always, I mean, well, not always. They're mostly pretty good. <laughs> They're mostly good. Off and off. Yeah, for the most part. So cool. Yeah, I'll have to check that out one of these days. So I think we gave a pretty eclectic group of recommendations here, I would say. Yeah, and I think that's the beauty of Amazon Prime. I, I This may be a bit of a hot take, but I like this more than Netflix because mm -hmm. I think Netflix on occasion may feel more along the lines of like samey at times, like mm -hmm. movies with like a similar like tone and structure and all of that. I had no trouble finding a variety here. Yeah. Well, in Netflix, their original movies, talk about hit and miss. Of course, they have like your Roma and, and Marriage Story and, you know, like Irishman, things like that. All three of uh, them. But then they have. Collection now. They have so many things like the Kissing Booth and like those Adam Sand, terrible Adam Sandler movies. And I mean, they have a lot of really bad original films. Uh, so they're definitely hit and miss. They have great series, uh, but then they have some mediocre series. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it's I think that Amazon Prime it's really a hidden gem. I mean, and, and Amazon Prime has a lot of series that people love. Like I said, with Mrs. Maisel, Invincible, The Boys, and a lot of people love that. I haven't seen that, but um, there's a lot of series now on Amazon Prime. Yeah, and even yeah. back catalog stuff like Down Abbey, the Avatar, mm -hmm. Last Bender, the original. I think Legend of Korra is on there as well. I got to double check. But yeah, it's... I think maybe you're right. Yeah. But it's got a lot of good stuff. Yeah, definitely. Well, let us know what you've been watching on, on Amazon Prime and what you think of our recommendations. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments section. And Ryan, where can people find you? They can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd, RyanCam20. Then there's, of course, my YouTube channel, which is just called Ryan Cam. Uh, I am currently sitting at 154 subscribers, so if I could just get one more to 155, that'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, the AFI project is coming to a close. I am legitimately on the last four movies I got to review. Amazing. We're recording, we're recording this on Monday, which means my video for Do the Right Thing dropped. And wow, that movie was certainly relevant, let's just say least. It's, it's very good, but very scary all at once. And the last four movies I got to review are Blade Runner, Yankee Doodle Dandy, the original Toy Story, and Ben-Hur, the 59 version, not the 2016 version, which is crap. No, the, the 59 That is version, a variety right there. <laughs> the 2016 four. version 
it is just terrible. The 59 version <laughs> swears out and the AFI project is done. And then oh af gosh. afterwards, I'm going to be resurrecting a series that I did when I could count my subscribers on like one hand and have fingers to spare. It's the Twilight Zone vlogs where I'll be reviewing every episode of the original The Twilight oh. Zone. Cool. And I'm halfway through season one, so I am not completely starting from scratch, but I've been like, I'm going to get back to it, I'm going to get back to it, and I never did. Well, this time, I'm getting back to it. And then, of course, I have my Sunday videos. I recently did it for the Born Trilogy and why I think it's better than you remember. And then this coming Sunday will be the next video in my I Finally Watched series, which is about the Cap Returns. So if you haven't checked me out, please do. Yeah, y'all should definitely check it out. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. I just recently crossed 4K Twitter uh, hey, followers, hey, so that was pretty hey. ooh, <laughs> that was pretty exciting. And so check me out on Twitter. I have a lot of fun over there. And I've also been going to see a lot of plays lately and musicals, and you can find all of my reviews uh, as well on my personal blog. I'll put a link in the description. Check that out. I have a lot of fun supporting local theater right now. And uh, also check out the Hallmark Youth Podcast. We actually have two author interviews this week. And so that's always a lot of fun to talk to authors. Uh, so even if you don't like Hallmark movies, there's a lot to enjoy over there. Uh, so take a look at that. And, uh, and we also have Best and Worst this week. Uh, we're going to be talking Pixar. So check out that. And thanks so much, everybody. Um, and check out the Patreon group and also the merch store. We really appreciate that. And we'll talk to you all later. Bye, everyone. Bye.